So here's an old AP exam for your response question. It appeared on the A, B, and B, C exams in 2012. It's a non-calculator question, and what they give us to work with is they give us this graph of F. Problem statement tells us a little bit about that graph. It tells us on the interval from negative 4 to 3, that graph is three line segments. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Maybe not quite so obvious since I drew on top of it a little bit. Um, and then g is the function defined right here. So g of x is defined as a definite integral. Notice the input to g is the upper limit of integration. And the integrand in this definition is f. And that's what we have a graph of. So what part a asks us to do, part a asks us to find two function values for g. g of 2 and then g of negative 2. So it's easy to overthink something like this, but it's actually really, really simple. Whenever you're evaluating a function at a given x, you're supposed to find that function. In this case, it's the function g. And you're supposed to take the x value that you want to evaluate it at and toss it in place of the x, which is the upper limit of integration, in the function. So when I put 2 in place of the x, I end up needing to figure out the value of this definite integral. From here, you're going to have to realize, hey, a definite integral of f from 1 to 2 is going to correspond to the signed area between f and the x-axis or the t-axis on the interval from 1 to 2. So if you go from 1 to 2, what you end up with is you end up with uh, this little triangle that I drew in in blue. Now that triangle does entirely sit below the x-axis or the t-axis. So I manually made that area negative, and then here's a 1 half base of that triangle, one unit along the x-axis, height of that triangle is uh, one half unit down. Right? If I try to go from this point to this point, that's a rise of negative one and then a run of two. So if I'm just rising, if, if I'm only trying to run over one, I would have to rise uh, down just a half. In the second part of that, it's a similar calculation. We want to evaluate g of negative 2. So I toss negative 2 in place of the x and g. And I end up with this situation. 1 is my lower limit. Negative 2 is my upper limit. Uh, in order to use signed area arguments the way that you've defined them to work, you're going to want to make sure that the lower numerical value, the smaller numerical value, is the lower limit of integration. And then the larger numerical value is the upper limit of integration. You're always able to flip the limits of integration as long as you negate the sign, as long as you negate the integral. So I'm looking at finding the signed area between f of t and the t-axis on the interval from negative 2 to 1. So negative 2 to 1 spans this stretch of the axis. So you see I drew this one in red. Uh, I have to find the area of this triangle. Now that triangle sits above the x-axis or the t-axis, so I'm finding the area of it as a positive. So here's 1 half. Base of that triangle is 1 unit height of that triangle is three units. And then I'm subtracting off the area that sits down here. Now that's a semicircle. The radius of that semicircle is one unit. So I did a pi r squared, but I had to multiply that by a half in order to turn it into the area of the half circle rather than the full circle. Uh, on, on the actual AP exam and a non-calculator question like this, this answer right here would receive full credit. This answer right here would receive full credit as well. You're teacher, your professor might be asking you to go uh, to a simplified answer. So you see that simplified answer for the first part of this, and then the simplified answer for the second part after I distribute this negative into both terms and clean each term up a little bit, I end up with that result. Part B, we want to find g prime of negative 3 and g double prime of negative 3, or state that the value does not exist. So before we can find g prime of negative 3, we need to find g prime of x. So when I take g of x and I attempt to take the derivative of it, this is a direct application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Whenever we're taking the derivative of a function that's defined this way, what we're going to do is we're going to copy the integrand and we're going to replace the upper we're going to replace the t, or the dummy variable, with that upper limit of integration. So g prime of x is simply equivalent to f of x. Um, so g prime of negative 3 is equal to f of 3, right? Same thing as before. I'm, I'm putting negative 3 in place of this x, so I put negative 3 in place of this x. Well, f of negative 3 I can find on this graph. Now, I do have to kind of do some rise over run arguments here to be certain what my y value on f is at the x of negative 3. And if you're careful with that, you're going to determine that that y value is positive 2. I also wanted to find g double prime of negative 3, so g double prime of x. 
Well, if I take the derivative of this, I end up with f prime of x. So g double prime of x is equal to f prime of x. g double prime of negative 3 is equal to f prime of negative 3. f prime of negative 3 is the slope of the tangent line to f at this location. Well, this location is a spot on f where we have a line segment showing up. So the slope of the tangent line to the line segment is just the slope of the line itself. Rise of 1, run of 1, rise of 1, run of 1. 1 over 1 obviously gives us a slope of 1. Part C asks us to find the x-coordinates where g is going to have a horizontal tangent line. So a horizontal tangent line is going to be a place where the derivative is equal to zero, right? The horizontal line has a slope of zero. Uh, if it's a tangent line, its slope has to be determined by the derivative. So if you just kind of connect those dots together, uh, you end up realizing, hopefully, that you need to locate where g prime of x is equal to zero. So that's pretty easy to do because back in the last part of the problem, we said g prime of x is equal to f of x. So we basically need to know when f of x equals zero in order to figure out when g prime of x equals zero. And that happens twice. That happens at the x of negative one and it happens at the x of one. So here are the two locations where we have a horizontal tangent on the graph of g. It goes on to say for those points determine whether g has a max, a min, or neither at each of those points. Justify your answer. So you could do this with a sign chart but like you've probably heard, a sign chart isn't going to satisfy the justification requirement of the College Board graders. So you're going to have to verbally explain your thought process. I just went straight to the verbal explanation here. Since g prime equals f of x and it changes from positive to negative at this x value. Here's f of x positive, here's f of x negative, f of x is equal to g prime. So g prime changes positive to negative at that spot you're going to have a relative max when the derivative changes from positive to negative. So relative max at negative 1. Uh, at positive 1, the value of g prime is the same as the value of f. That's negative to the left of 1. It's still negative to the right of 1. So although we have a horizontal tangent at that x, we have neither a max or a min there because we don't have a sign change for the derivative at that value. Last part of this says, can you find where G is going to have a point of inflection? Explain your reasoning. So inflection points occur on graphs where we have changes in concavity. Concavity is determined by the second derivative. The second derivative of G is F prime. The only time the second derivative can ever change signs is if it's first equal to zero or undefined. So I was looking at this graph and I was trying to figure out what I needed to determine in order to figure out where g prime of x was zero or undefined. Well, if g prime is equal to f prime, I'm looking at slope of this graph to determine f prime. Slope is undefined at this cusp. Slope is undefined at this cusp. Slope is undefined at this cusp. And slope is equal to zero right down here on the y-axis where the circle bottoms out. So there are actually four locations. The locations of the three cusps, negative two, negative one, and positive one, and then that location where we have a horizontal tangent on f or a, a value of zero for g double prime. So these are the values that we need to consider as potential inflection points, but we need to have a sign change in the second derivative and thus a, a change in concavity in order to confirm that we have an inflection point there. So we have f prime positive, 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 undefined, negative on the other side. So we can say, yep, we've got an inflection point at negative 2. As we get closer to negative 1, we're going negative, 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 negative slope. On the other side, we're still dealing with a negative slope. So although the second derivative is undefined at the x of negative 1, it's not listed here as an inflection point because there's no sign change in the second derivative. As we continue to progress across the graph, negative, 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 negative toward zero. On the other side, positive slopes here. So we do have an inflection point at zero. And then working further to the right, positive, positive, positive slope till we get to the cusp, and then negative on the other side. So we do have a, a sign change for g double prime at this x, this x, and this x. And that tells us we have inflection points at each of them.